Desde Corea del Sur tenemos a Jin Sun Lee, que es de Waggle, una organización que ahora os explicaré un poco mejor qué hace. Tenemos a Diego Arredondo, de Wikipolítica, de México. Tenemos a Richard Bartlett, de New Zealand, de Nueva Zelanda. Tenemos a Audrey Tang, de Taiwán. Y tenemos a Marcos Ashi, de, bueno, Ámsterdam, Francia... Europe. 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 <risa> Entonces vamos a empezar como en el orden que están, estamos sentados. Entonces va, voy a darle la palabra a Jin Sun Lee, que viene de Corea del Sur, de una organización muy, muy joven, tiene varios meses de existencia. Y para que os hagáis una idea, Waggle eh, significa We All Govern Lab. Es decir, es un laboratorio que pretende usar la tecnología para que la gente de manera distribuida pueda eh, organizarse y pueda, eh, 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 digamos, eh, mejorar eh, la potencia de sus movimientos y, y tomar incluso decisiones. ¿no? Entonces, eh, le doy la palabra a Jin Sully. Gracias, everybody. Thank you for nice introduction, Yago, and thank you for inviting me to this uh, great event, Francesca. And I'm so honored to speak with you. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about uh, three initiatives uh, Waggle has done so far. Before the discussion on the project, let me introduce a little bit about the brief history of Korean politics and the background of Waggle. Yeah, once upon a time in Korea, there was a little girl named Jinson. It's me. Uh, I was a little activist struggling for democracy. Those days, democracy in Korea meant anti-communism. There were only two sides of the world, communism versus democracy and evil versus good. For a long time, since the Korean War in 1950, um, the opposition word of democracy was communism. So what we had to do to protect our democracy was just one thing, killing all the rest. Yay, that's the poster. <laughs> when I became 20 years old though, uh, the meaning of democracy has changed, has changed for me. I was actively involved in the student movement and was imprisoned. And then I willingly became a low wage uh, factory worker, uh, hiding my educational background to participate in the labor movement. For my generation in the 1980s, Democracy was anti-dictatorship. What we had to do was struggles against anti-dictatorship. Those two types of democracies, anti-communism and anti-dictatorship, have dominated the main discourse of democracy for a half century in Korea. When I was, yeah, when I was 40 years old, it seemed that uh, we were approaching the real democracy by shifting dominant political power in Korea. Many of my friends, uh, activist friends, stepped into politics by becoming congressmen or the secretaries, uh, advisors in the presidential, pre presidential office. So, did we achieve real democracy? What has been changed? in Korean politics. This is the current politics in Korea. <laughs> Are they enjoying siesta? <laughs> Negligence, incompetence, and corruption, including yeah, the former prime minister, congressman, governor, president, secretaries. There is no difference, actually, between the ruling party and the opposition party. Nearly nine out of 10 Koreans distrust domestic politicians, according to polls. Probably one, of out, uh, one out of 10 would be their family members. On April 13, uh, this year, we had a general election. 
Opposition party, the Liberals, won 123 seats, while the Conservatives lost many seats. The, the first one uh, represent anti-dictatorship democracy, while uh, the second represent anti-communism. But there is no big difference. Progressives have taken only 2% of the whole seats. No alternative for the others. Conventionally defined democracies were neither updated nor democratized for a long time. So, who do they represent? As a matter of fact, the average personal property of the newly elected congressman is about 1.6 million euro, even except big three giants who own more than 100 million euro. Considering that the average uh, top 1% of Koreans have only 0 0.7 million euro, most MPs are super rich. Their average age is more than 55. They are too rich, too old, and too well educated. So it's hard to believe that they will be able to represent part-time workers, unemployed people, and social minorities. There are many systematic barriers for ordinary citizens to raise their political voices. Age restriction is one of the legal obstacles. Politics in Korea is like R rating movie. So, a Korean youth less than 19 years old do not have suffrage. Korea is the only country over there, very, where is it? Yeah, very small, but you can see the sky blue color. Yeah, Korea is the only country which has the voting age of 19. So where do we start? How can we reconstruct democracy we have lost? What is the way in which people raise their own voice in political fields? Many citizens have already demonstrated that they are able to and they are willing to organize their own actions with no mediation of any institutionalized leadership. They have mobilized petitions and street gatherings with no centralized leadership. But many citizens are still out of politics. Korean politics is not responding to them. The words between citizens and politicians are robust and very exclu exclusive. Wagle dreams of the different future. Wagle wants to adopt a different way of democratization. Our dream is democracy by the crowd. Say Wagle, please. Wagle. Wagle. Yeah, not Wagle, it's Wagle. Uh, Wagle is the acronym of We All Govern Lab. At the same time, it also refers to uh, some imitative word of the chatting noise. Wagle, 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 like a babble in English. Wagle is a politics startup, uh, a social venture dedicated to transforming political status quo by uh, collective intelligence of the crowd. Wagle aims to change the grammar of politics, not only by changing the dominant power from this party to other party, or from this candidate to other candidate, we want to reshape the whole political landscape by participatory innovation. We, de we define political innovation as empowering citizens by reforming political de decision-making processes. We are committed to three goals. Technology for the crowd, community by the crowd, and leadership of the crowd. In the era of the internet and social media, I believe we cannot achieve democracy without considering a variety of ways of direct democracy based online communications. By breaking the existing rules, we want to reconstruct new rules of politics. To pursue these goals, Wagle has done many projects 
public campaigns, research and publications, public lectures in international workshops. Uh, in the crowdfunded publication we have done here, 1.168% one uh, of the fund have been gained. And we introduced many provoking international cases, citizen participation uh, cases, including Ahura Madrid, Barcelona and Commune, and Decide Madrid, Govzero, Lumio, and Open Ministry, etc. Many of you can find your cases on our web. On the past, uh, yeah, on the past, I, I want to introduce the first project among them. On the past February 23rd, in the last session before the general election, the ruling party submitted an anti-terrorism bill that would grant wide-ranging surveillance powers to the intelligence services. In response, the opposition party staged a filibuster. Filibuster is a parliamentary procedure allowing one or more members to delay or entirely prevent a vote on the proposal by going on speech. When the filibuster uh, started, uh, nobody expected that it, it would last so long. Few people stayed at the Congress Hall, main chamber. Citizens, though, kept chatting and cheering up the speakers, watching what is going on. When the first speaker was about three hours into his first speech, we sensed that the internet was having with expectation. Um, so we wanted to build a site that would fulfill an urgent need. Korean filibuster laws yeah, requires the legislator to stay on topic. The speaker must keep on the podium. That requires more than a bladder of steel. They cannot go to the restroom either. Also, that requires a whole bunch of speech notes, scripts, focusing on that topic. What if we could concentrate people's voices into a single microphone and connect a code into the parliament building? What if what you type in a site could directly make it into the main chamber of the National Assembly real time? Filibuster.me uh, asked the people to make their own voices to be heard through the speech on, of uh, MPs. During 11 days, including some more time after the filibuster, 300,000 people visited the site and 38,000 citizens participated in speech writing relay. Hundreds of speech scripts were read by seven MPs and reported by um, major news media. This is what we did during the world's longest filibuster that lasted for 192 hours. Koreans learned for the first time that we can make politicians people's avatars. So followingly, we also made an uh, assembly email that is um, e um, online survey. It's kind of e-petition sent to the chair of National Assembly. Uh, there are only three questions, yes, no questions. Filibuster needs to be stopped and anti-terrorism uh, bill is, uh, uh, is correct, uh, is right. That kind of very simple question. Yeah, let me skip some slides. And also we have provided some uh, voting guide service app to attract more young voters um, to participate in voting. So, let me wrap up my presentation. What is democracy we are seeking in this century? President Obama spoke recently that 
just a boat. Politics is just uh, about math. Do you agree? I do not agree. Politics is not just math. Politics is not just political engineering. Politics is art. Art moves people. Art provokes empathy. Art makes people happier. The politics we need is accountable, responsive, and transparent processes of human interactions. Wagle uh, is trying to spread new concept of politics by building a real-time, transparent, responsive communication channels between the political field with uh, common people. So I'm very happy to find all of you here, many uh, democracy artists around the world. Thank you very much. Eh, bueno, eh, antes se me ha olvidado comentar una cosa. No sé si, desde, si podéis poner la pantalla inicial de Slido que está en el, en el portátil. Vale, eh, esto no, no se me olvidó explicarlo. Eh, vamos a recopilar preguntas a través de, de, esta, de este dominio que es slido.com. Una vez que os metáis, solo tenéis que meter ese número y os meteréis en el, en el canal de, donde se pueden lanzar las preguntas. Las preguntas se pueden evaluar. Este es una especie de experimento, ¿vale? Intentaremos luego responder a las preguntas eh, con mayor valoración, de manera que, bueno, por aportar un, un punto diferente ¿no? a cómo se han hecho las preguntas anteriormente. Eh, vamos a continuar, eh, nos vamos a México ahora, damos la vuelta al mundo y nos vamos con Diego Arredondo de Wikipolítica, que como su nombre dice, es un nuevo movimiento político que incluso tiene representación en, en Guadalajara, ¿no? Es así. Y, y bueno, pues es, su nom su, el nombre de Wiki ya nos dice mucho de lo que están intentando, ¿no? Que es usar, eh, se están intentando inspirar en las formas que vienen de, de los formatos de, de compartir, ¿no? De, de las redes para crear un nuevo movimiento político. Diego, te doy la palabra. Gracias, Diego. Eh, ¿Se escucha? Sí. Ah, gracias. Eh, hola, ¿qué tal? Muchas gracias por, por venir, por la invitación. Eh, todos mis compañeros y compañeras están, estamos como muy emocionados de poder compartir eh, lo que vivimos en estos últimos años, sobre todo el año pasado, eh, con Wikipolítica. Rápidamente, eh, bueno, Wikipolítica es la organización, Pedro Kumamoto es el eh, representante electo en el Congreso de Jalisco, es el primer eh, diputado independiente local en la historia del país. Eh, y lo hicimos a través de una campaña bastante bottom up de red de redes eh, que posibilitó esta, esta victoria electoral que, que les voy a contar. Eh, rápidamente, Wikipolítica es una red descentralizada, estamos en tres nodos del país, eh, compartimos principios, métodos de trabajo, el nombre, muchas cosas, pero realmente estamos organizados de una forma autónoma, cada, cada ciudad y estado toma sus propias decisiones porque creemos que, que el movimiento debe ser local, estamos tejiendo red de redes lo más locales posibles eh, para generar eh, espacios de participación, espacios de encuentro y ocupar uno a uno espacios en instituciones que hoy han sido cooptados por la partidocracia de siempre eh, y de alguna forma, aunque sean pequeños estos espacios, ir como insertando, sembrando prácticas eh, políticas disruptivas, dignas, colectivas, que no van a venir desde los partidos. Y también entendemos lo político como algo más amplio, pues eh, no, no solo nos abocamos a lo electoral, sino tratamos de generar espacios de pedagogía eh, orientados como al encuentro en espacios públicos, eh, discusión entre colectivos, articulación entre sociedad civil. Eh, más o menos un poco los principios que nos tienen eh, aquí, eh, son como principios mínimos, de donde eh, buscamos agregar distintas visiones alrededor de una, otro tipo de participación, ¿no? de, con mínimos claros, como una eh, visión pro, eh, progresiva de los derechos humanos, o sea, vamos avanzando en la carrera de obtener derechos, nunca hacia atrás, y bueno, todo, todo lo demás que pueden ver por ahí. Eh, y bueno, quiero presentar esto como... Pude analizar más o menos para esta plática siete hacks que pudimos eh, encontrar para hacer lo que hicimos ¿no? y cómo nos organizamos, cómo ganamos y cómo operamos dentro del Congreso. El primero es esto, hackear un sistema de partidos. Es, México no solo es un sistema cerrado, sino es un sistema 
sumamente autoritario y violento. Quiero, quiero como eh, remarcar eso, ¿no? Está asesinando y desapareciendo estudiantes con los 43 de Ayotzinapa. Hay, eh, solo, en, solo en Veracruz hay, más de, hay 18 periodistas eh, muertos en este sexenio. Es un estado... Eh, se está espiando a la gente por métodos legales e ilegales. Se están... Eh, eh, incluso eh, regulando el uso de la fuerza, incluso con armas letales contra la población. Eh, entonces, hay estrategias de desinformación que están tratando de impulsar una serie de reformas estratégicas como la energética, la de telecomunicaciones, que solo están, que están destinadas a fracasar a nivel país, pero están eh, concentradas, eh, bueno, están destinadas a concentrar el poder en las mismas manos. Entonces, eh, bueno, un poco las manifestaciones, fue el Estado en Ayotzinapa, fue una foto mítica en el Zócalo del país. Um, y, y eso, ¿no? <risa> Hay una crisis de representación increíble, o sea, nu nunca habían tenido tan poca legitimidad los partidos políticos, surgió una encuesta eh, justo en el año electoral que 80% de las personas no se sienten representados, pero no pueden generarse nuevos partidos políticos porque las reglas están hechas por y para los poderosos, se necesitan eh, más de 220 mil afiliados, eh, 20 estados en 20, 20 asambleas en 20 estados diferentes con 3.000 personas presenciales, todas con acta firmada y ratificados ante el Instituto Electoral, cosas que solo alguien con un una capacidad de concentración de poder clientelar, corporativista, que puede cooptar sindicatos para luego intercambiar favores, puede lograr. Entonces, pero hubo algo, la reforma política de 2012, impulsado por la presión internacional y la presión de sociedad civil local, ese es un campamento afuera, afuera del Senado, de, de reforma política ya, eh, que lograron de alguna forma impulsar esta legislación que, que creara nuevas figuras, entre ellas los candidatos independientes, que se legislaron para imposibilitarse. O sea, eh, las condiciones son totalmente ridículas en las desventajas que se plantean, pero por lo menos hay algo, ¿no? Entonces ahí es donde vivimos un punto de entrada. En algún punto pensamos en ser un partido, pero abandonamos en meses muy rápido esa idea y planteamos, ok, vamos por esta figura nueva, es la primera vez que se va a usar, tenemos una oportunidad de eh, marcar un precedente de cómo creemos que podrían hacerse las cosas y aunque todo esté en nuestra contra, por lo menos podremos crear un primer puente, un primer puente de prácticas distintas. Eh, y así surgió Wish Política. Eh, esto, hackear el, compar el comportamiento electoral. Eh, después de una discusión muy larga, eh, que se prolongó como dos años y medio, fuimos acotando el... De entrada, si, si valía la pena participar en nuevas instituciones, luego si sí, si hacerlo en 2015, y poco a poco no, eh, fue un proceso de, de consensos entre reuniones presenciales, usando mucho Lumio también, eh, hasta que decidimos, ok, vamos por el Distrito 10 local en Jalisco, que es ese pingüino que ven ahí, eh, y, y, y anal, lo analizamos de distintas metodologías, ¿no? tanto empíricas entre la gente que teníamos más o menos la experiencia de vivir ahí, como eh, por una serie de encuestas que, que llevamos en todo el, en, el distrito y también visualización de datos abiertos que nos arrojaban que era el, el, el distrito con más acceso a internet, más jóvenes, más centros educativos eh, y sobre todo un algo clave, voto diferenciado. En México la gente, las ciudades votan por bloques, están cooptadas por los partidos, tienen operadores políticos que les, les funciona muy bien la ignorancia y la pobreza a su favor, entonces eh, realmente no hay, no hay voluntades tan claras como aquí, donde la gente puede votar a un partido para el presidente municipal, otro para el Congreso, otro para el presidente de la República o para la gobernatura. Y también algo, algo clave es que estaba era caminable, eso fue muy importante, o sea, tenía, no teníamos recursos y teníamos que hacer una recopilación de firmas y solo podíamos hacer a pie, en bici o en transporte público, entonces como teníamos que cubrir un mínimo de, 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 de superficie, pues teníamos que poderlo caminar. Eh, las firmas que nos pidieron todas tenían que venir con, eh, eran 5400 por lo menos y todas con copia impresa, eh, de, de la, del DNI, de la identificación con todos los datos y la fotografía de cada persona, una cosa terrible. Eh, y tenía que ser presentada en el orden que, que decía el folio o no valían. Al, nomás rápido viendo los datos, ese es el, el pingüino del Distrito 10, y si ven la cabeza se puede ver donde, donde hay menos concentración de internet, más eh, eh, reportes ante el Ministerio Público de violencia y de delitos, que también son los lugares más, eh, más pobres de, del distrito, también es donde hubo menos voto nulo en el movimiento de anulación del voto de 2009 y vote el único lugar de, de un claro voto en bloque contra el PRI, digo, a favor del PRI. Eh, así es como operan. <risa> eh, y bueno, otra cosa fue eh, hackear el discurso electoral. ¿no? Buscamos un discurso agregador que pudiera eh, plantar ciertos valores eh, 
a, a partir del imaginario compartido que pudieran sentir como propio, ¿no? un, un discurso que, que eh, invitara a las personas a participar, que las situara como eh, piezas clave en el relato, eh, frases que podían pues, igual eh, tomar de sus propios referentes, pero que finalmente los invitaban a la acción y a, y a participar por primera vez eh, con, con algo de, de esperanza, o sea, encontrar un espacio que jamás habían tenido desde los partidos. Eh, y bueno, un poco de las frases que fuimos usando, se convirtieron poco a poco en, en gritos de guerra. Y, y eso, ¿no? Esto permitió incluso escalar, hacer saltos generacionales. Y empezamos 15 eh, universitarios, postuniversitarios, todos millennials, al final había muchísimos ancianitos. <ríe> y eh, acaban siendo la, la, la gente más, más prendida, ¿no? La, la gente que, que más lograba convencer personas. Eh, bueno, el escuma. Esto fue clave también, sobre todo durante las firmas, ser honestos, pedir ayuda. Nos dieron solo 40 días, se me olvidó eso. Las firmas estas con copia física tenían que juntarse en 40 días. Entonces, eh, íbamos a la mitad, hicimos, confiábamos que plantándonos en espacios públicos y refan, eh, repartiendo folios entre las redes, íbamos a, como exponencialmente, iban a volver las firmas y no volvían ni una. Y gran parte de eso es porque la gente nos veía fuertes en redes sociales y pensaba que íbamos bien y pues no nos... No, no venían las firmas. Bueno, se está acabando un poco del tiempo, voy a avanzar un poco más rápido. La página fue tal vez el documento más bonito que tenemos, los invito a visitarla, el más genuino, concentraba todas las cosas que, que, que eran eh, la, la, la identidad, las propuestas, los videos. Eh, eh, hackear los espacios públicos, entendimos que el, el punto está en medio, ¿no? O sea, en mandar a las personas de la esfera pública virtual a la territorial y, y, y de vuelta, de entrar a recuperar los espacios públicos territoriales, porque o sea, Popa es una ciudad de murallas, la gente vive encerrada en sus fraccionamientos con bardas y cámaras, tiene mucho miedo, entonces fue un ejercicio político de encuentro entre organizaciones y personas, volver a discutir sobre lo común. Eh, bueno, ahí estábamos juntando firmas, <risa> hicimos ese rally donde juntamos, eh, una campaña de contrastes en la calle frente a los partidos de siempre, llenando de basura electoral, a ver gente con convicción que estaba tratando de convencer a las personas. Eh, otro tipo de actividades, happy meetings, donde las personas no solo eran públicos pasivos que les dieron una torta y una banderita, y, sino que podían, podían eh, ir a, a, a platicar y a incluso tomar el micrófono y, y, y compartir lo suyo. Eh, bueno, evidenciar estos vínculos entre lo offline y lo online en todo lo que hacíamos. Eh, incluso campañas paralelas, hicimos una como campaña distribuida, nodos de personas, incluso mayores, que hacían con sus propios métodos y lenguajes, propagaban el mensaje. Y que esta red nos generó, nos eh, posibilitó tener el día de la elección casi 500 personas representantes de casilla para defender nuestros votos. Bueno, los votos de las personas, evitar que se hicieran fraudes. Eh, bueno, hackear la burocracia es tal vez de lo más importante. Eh, las reglas estaban, otra vez, hechas por y para los poderosos, entonces las reglas no estaban claras, no estaban legisladas ni de cómo íbamos a competir, ni una vez ganando, cómo íbamos a gobernar. Entonces, eh, había ciertas cosas más o menos marcadas en la, en la primera legislación, no en la secundaria. ¿Cómo, ¿Cuánto recibiríamos? Si fue de dinero público, recibimos eh, menos de 800 euros. En total, eh, cuando los otros partidos gastaron como 50 mil para la candidatura, entonces eh, hicimos una red de microdonaciones con un tope máximo de 7 mil pesos, que son como 350 euros, para, eh, para eh, pues eso, ¿no? eh, mantener la autonomía y evitar el despilfarro. Eh, un poco cuando las procesamos, no lo hubiéramos logrado para nada, fueron, nos dieron dos días para procesar 8 mil firmas, y entregarlas en el orden que pedían. Eh, fue, fue un rally donde la gente fue colapsando, hubo muchos soldados caídos. Eh, y no lo hubiéramos hecho sin ese programa, que él y nuestro programador genial se improvisó un programa durante la noche para poder eh, imprimir todos los formatos sistematizados y llegaron calientitas las impresiones al, al Instituto Electoral. Entonces, eh, lo mismo para fiscalización, una exageración, se generó una especie de API para poder entregar en tiempo y forma lo que nos pedían. Eh, lo mismo para el sistema horrible de, para registrar los representantes de casilla. Hicimos un sistema de conteo de votos preliminar donde supi, de manera como distribuida, crowdsourceada, donde supimos antes que el Instituto Electoral con la misma fidelidad en los datos que habíamos ganado. Eh, y bueno, eso, hack, un poquito esto es tal vez lo más importante, es 
donde estamos ahorita, ¿no? Hackear las cúpulas de poder. O sea, el discurso más fuerte al final era uno contra 39 que están en el Congreso no van a poder hacer nada, están tirando su voto a la basura. Al principio se ignoraban, después empezaron a tratar de tocarnos con eso. Y, y lo importante es que se generó una red tan, tan grande. Ah, perdón. Se ganaron 57 mil votos. La siguiente fuerza política, un, pal, un partido político nuevo que arrasó en el Estado, eh, estuvo 22 puntos abajo. O sea, si antes era un bastión del partido más conservador del país, se lo arrebatamos por completo. No nosotros, sino las redes de personas que empezaron a, a generar espacios para, para tomar decisiones dentro. Eh, mucha cobertura en medios nacionales e internacionales, lo cual generó una red orgánica a la cual finalmente era muy difícil Oponersele, oponerse a nosotros, ¿no? decir, decir que no genera un costo político tan duro eh, que ahora somos parte de cinco comisiones, eh, como es presidente de la, de la comisión que más nos interesaba, eh, que es la participación ciudadana y se acaba de aprobar la semana pasada la, primer, la reforma más progresista de participación ciudadana del país. Entonces, bueno, un poco más, eh, tengo uno adentro, pero bueno, creo que se me acabó el tiempo, solo... Quiero, quiero decir eso, ¿no? sembrar prácticas políticas dignas, disruptivas y plantear otra idea, el último hack de una organización política, ¿no? que no puede estar, que tiene que integrar puentes entre institucional, movimientos sociales y sociedad civil. Gracias. Bueno, eh, increíble, tanto Wagle como Wikipolítica. Eh, nos vamos ahora a, cambiamos otra vez, de, nos damos la vuelta al mundo, al, al hemisferio sur y nos vamos a, digamos que el, el Occupy generó Lumio, que es una herramienta que ahora se está usando mucho aquí, es decir, que digamos que el 15M como inspiró también o ayudó a inspirar Occupy, Occupy eh, genera Lumio, Lumio vuelve a nosotros, eh, Sabéis que Lumio es uno de los lugares de más usos del mundo, es España. Y bueno, aquí está Richard, cofundador de Lumio, para explicarnos un poco lo que quiera explicarnos. Le dejamos que hable de lo que sea. I like that. Whatever I want to tell you. Um, I, I actually I feel a little bit nervous today because um, you know Yago invited me to come and talk on this panel about tools. It was the come and talk about tools. And I'm invited to talk about tools because I'm an engineer and I'm a co-founder of a technology company. Um, but I'm not really interested in talking about tools anymore and not really that interested in technology anymore. I want to um, talk about culture and about power. And I'm nervous because I don't think I'm very good at it. Um, but I think it's really important that the technology founders are talking about culture and talking about power because there's a lot of ignorant discourse about the relationship between technology and power. So forgive me as I learn my way into this role. I think it's an important one. Um, this morning we heard in the panel some of the threats of technology, the threats to democracy. So um, two that stuck out most pressingly for me, one was about total surveillance. So if everything we do is transparent, that's a, a weapon of control. And the other one was about um, inequity. So Um, if the majority of internet, people accessing the internet happen to look like me, um, then people who happen to act like me and look like me are going to have more power than others. And obviously that's unfair if we're going to be running a democracy on those platforms. So those are real pressing threats and we need to engage with them seriously. Um, but my experience as an activist tells me that um, threats are not the only way to motivate people. You know, like there's actually another half of that coin. There's, there's the, um, the threat, but there's also the promise. And uh, I, I feel like to create a, a wave of change or a, or a movement, we need to ha have a balance of both. And so I wanted to try and illustrate a, a tiny bit about the promise of, for instance, what is the promise of having um, total surveillance? What is the, prom what, what is the value of um, doing things in public? Um, And, you know, one tiny example, Audrey's come and sat down and she's put this thing here, which is a camera that's recording in 360 degrees out to about this space. Um, and it will be published. Oh, oh, focus, it's just this range. So all your face are safe. It's yeah. privacy protection. By default. So this, this is not just on stage because we're in a public meeting. Audrey pulls this out when we're having a private conversation. We don't have a private conversation. We just broadcast what we're doing to the web. Not because we're so egotistical that we think everyone needs to see it but because we think that by doing things transparently, we gain trust and we can learn from each other. 
So um, I, I, I guess I wanted to tell a, a little bit of my personal narrative so you can situate what I'm saying. Um, because I come from a very bizarre place called New Zealand, and it's bizarre because it's like absurdly peaceful. So I have this very distorted view of reality um, where everyone is nice to each other and the cops don't wear guns when they walk around and stuff like that. <laughs> um, so w a lot of what I'll say might sound like garbage as a result. Um, when I was um, graduating from university in uh, 2008, I don't know if you remember 2008, but there was this um, financial thing that meant that nobody had any jobs. So I graduated as an engineer into a market that didn't have any engineering jobs. Um, and so sort of by necessity, I discovered the open source hardware movement. So I was an electronics engineer, I was a musician, um, I wanted to make electronic devices for musicians, and I found there was this community that was designing, inventing, um, remixing these devices and just leaving them out in public and licensing them to be remixed. So I started participating in that thing where people were sharing their knowledge freely and, and just contributed to it on a, without really thinking about it. Um, and I think that experience gave me a, a particular, peculiar expectation about politics. I thought, well, if I can remix um, an electronics design, why can't I remix uh, a piece of legislation? Um, and why is this legislation centered on one geographical area when my collaborators are international? Why can't we do the same with legislation? Um, so I had this sort of read-write expectation about politics that wasn't matching the reality that I could see. And so when the Occupy movement started in 2011, I felt like a glimmer of, of recognition with what those weird people were talking about. We weird people were talking about. Um, so yeah, I participated in Occupy, and like so many people that have participated in these um, horizontal movements, the experience was profoundly transformative to me. It changed my identity, it changed my behavior, it changed my culture, it changed my way of relating to people. Um, and, and so much of that I put down to the experience of sitting in a circle face-to-face -face with people and talking and listening. Um, in my case, it was more transformative to, to practice listening. Um, the problem obviously was, as we heard yesterday, an assembly is not necessarily a great way to make decisions. It's a great way to build effective bonds and build solidarity, but it's not very effective for making decisions because you only hear from one person at a time and you only hear from the people that happen to turn up. So that's where the concept for Lumio came was, well, maybe we can do this decision-making thing online and make it more accessible to people. You can have people talking at the same time. You don't have to be in the same room. So we have um, sketched out this very simple tool, which is a discussion forum where anyone in the discussion can make a proposal and ask the group what they feel about it. Um, and, and we've had a continuous connection with the ongoing movement of movements um, to try and adapt this tool to meet their needs. And so that was how I met Audrey, who's going to give us a tiny introduction to Okay, so uh, in 2014, we occupied the Taiwan parliament for 22 days, and there's half a million of people on the street. And it's because at that time, the parliament refused to deliberate a trade agreement with China because they think Beijing is a domestic city of Taiwan. So the idea is that they refused the normal process about international trade agreements. So the occupiers occupied the parliament for 22 days, demonstrating how to deliberate about this kind of a trade agreement. So this is a constructive uh, demo of Occupy. And at that time, the, nobody, including the police, knew that people are doing such a thing. So so when they arrived and set up this live video uh, streaming, uh, the police tried to surround them, but by that time, we already have broadcasted to hundreds of uh, people, million people online, who all came to Taipei to counter surround the police and forced a truce. And so uh, the other uh, 20 days, people just started to learn from professional facilitators how to deliver about things like that and demo it on the street. And the GovZero Collective, the community, set up the uh, ICT connection to uh, broadcast everything uh, to everybody online, and including through people on the street and so on. And, but we have a problem because uh, like lawyers and physicians, we enjoy the privilege of this fast uh, track lane uh, because we're neutral, right? We protect the rights of everybody. But our uh, logo is Creative Commons. So there's a lot of people just printing them at home and putting them on the badge and say, hey, we want to join the ICT Corp. Now, many of them are well, like intentioned people, engineers, like thousands of people, but many of them are also just tourists who want this fast access lane. So we use Lumio 
and and to to have an online like decision, it, we start some with some very bad idea like exchanging uh, Medicare cards or ID cards or driver license, which doesn't scale, by the way. And then uh, gradually grow into uh, like feelings, facts, feelings, facts, feelings, ideas, ideas, feelings, and finally we converge on an idea that everybody feels comfortable with, which is when anybody new shows up with this self printed badge, we ask what's two to the power of sixteen. And if they can answer this question on the spot, they are an engineer. Welcome. <laughs> and and so, so that's how we very constructively use Lumia to solve this kind of collaborative decision problems. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, and and you know, well, of course, the um, <laughs> social movements are using Lumio. Also, the city governments are using Lumio, and the community groups and the businesses and so on as well. Um, but it's just in this context I'm most excited about the, the radicals in the streets. Um, <laughs> I, I, when I went to visit Taiwan in, in 2014 to meet with these people that were um, deploying our technology in, in such creative ways, um, I was warned, because it was my first trip to Asia, I was warned that I was going to experience some culture shock, you know, that this is going to be a very foreign experience. And, and the shock for me was just how familiar these people were, that we had the same, we had the same sense of humor, we had the same, um, uh, the same way of, of relating to each other with, with peculiar um, characteristics that are very common to me in the hacker community, but not so, not so um, common in my neighborhood. So um, then, then this trip, you know, this is my first time in Europe. I'm, I'm, uh, I was in Paris a couple of days ago, and I met with um, Manu from the uh, Nuit de Boue movement. And once again, I had this experience of this person is like, my, my, I don't know the word for it. I, I want to say countryman, but I don't care for countries, and I don't, I don't care so much for the, the gender bit either. But like, I had such a tremendous sense of kinship with this person, um, and, and and it felt to me like we are we're sharing a kind of culture that's non-local, and it's a kind of culture that is um, profoundly democratic. That's a new kind of democratic culture that hasn't been seen before. Um, Manu told us a story of. Um, what it had been like for him to participate in this horizontal movement. And his story was one of personal transformation, and it was almost word for word the same story as mine. He talked about how radical it was to spend a week just listening to people, just listening unfiltered to the experience of others. And, and he, he talked about how he, you know, how, how he cried at the, the beauty of people just expressing themselves, um, and how that has, has totally, you know, totally shifted his perspective on, on the world. Um, and how there's a, um, he's, he's in the Numeric Commission, so he's part of the, the group that is um, prototyping different technologies to support the social movement. And in, within the group, they're finding it very easy to collaborate. They're, 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 they're part of the hacker culture, they're already open source software engineers, so they have a set of behaviors that they know how to cooperate. Um, and they're finding that inside the group, it's operating really well. But at the larger scale, they're finding it much more difficult to adapt the technology to meet the needs of the people there. And they, what, what I could see, and this is just my reading of what's happening there in, in Paris, but there's this particular specific culture that is composed of specific behaviors. Behaviors like, um, okay, to organize information, I use hashtags. I don't use folders, I use a hashtag, which is a, like a democratic way of, it's, it's, they call it a folksonomy rather than a taxonomy. You know, the, the, the popular hashtag is the one that people are using, not the one that someone decided was going to be the right one. Um, we use collaborative documents. So when I'm writing a document, I don't own the, own the words anymore. We just share the words together until we get the ideas right. There's this, this idea that authorship is gone. Um, we do iterative development. So instead of um, abstractly trying to design what's the best possible set of policies, we just build the smallest possible thing and then learn from it and then build the next thing. That's a particular kind of um, attribute that a lot of people don't have but it gives you a tremendous advantage when you're trying to negotiate with power. Um, we've got this culture of disagreeing by contribution. So instead of just saying you're wrong, you say, I disagree, here's my proposed alternative. In, in software land, that's totally normal. You do it all the time. When you think you see a problem, you just propose the solution to it, and if people like the solution, it will come in. If they don't, it's ignored. And yeah, like I mentioned, we're doing this living in public thing where, same, same as with Audrey, when I met with Manu, we said, I said, do you mind if I broadcast this conversation? And there was, no, no problem, of course, oh, absolutely. And that's very, that's very peculiar, you know? Most people are not that comfortable with the idea that 
what you're talking about, especially when it's about politics and identity, the idea that it'll be published and stored forever. But there's a benefit to doing it. So, yeah, I'm, I'm um, doing my traveling around the world thing and learning about different cultures and learning about um, how some cultures speak like this and, and some people speak very quietly. And from meeting people like, um, like Audrey and like Manu and, and other participants in these movements, I guess it's given me a sense of really what that word means when you hear people talking about the digital native. You know, like it, that for me has always been a meaningless, a meaningless idea that it, it, what, whatever a digital native is. But what I'm seeing it is it's actually like it's actually like a nation. Like it's it's a um, our collective identity is not attached to a geographic place and it's not attached to a a long history. It's attached to a history that's like 30 years old. Um, and, and it's got these particular characteristics as a result. I think it's got huge benefits, but it's also really naive and immature. And, and there's, a, there's a job to do to, to connect the, what do we know about geography? What do we know about material power? What do we know about history? And how do we take that knowledge and experience and translate it into this new generation, which is a nation that is, you know, living in virtual territory? and, and when I say ignorant, I mean, you know, like the blockchain bros who, who think that power and information are the same thing and that bodies are irrelevant, you know? Like there's just such an ignorant conversation happening in the world at the moment about blockchain as if bodies don't exist. But of course bodies exist and of course bodies have a tremendous impact on your experience of power. So we need to be having that conversation. Um, yesterday, Manuela Carmena reminded us of that great phrase about, you know, change Change is continuous confrontation. And I think, I think what's, what's coming down for me is that the, the, the kind of change that I'm interested in involves, like, it involves me continuously confronting myself and each of us continuously confronting ourselves. And that's a, um, an attitude uh, which is, it's risky, it's vulnerable, it's threatening to yourself and to your ego, but it's actually beneficial for everyone. And I'm, I'm you know, I'm trying to practice it. And I think the technology can support that kind of self-subverting authority. So a tiny little technology that we have in, in Lumio is that we're a worker-owned cooperative. So instead of being a CEO, instead of having people work for me, I have people that work with me. And we, we're subverting my egotistical tendencies with that legal form that says, if you've been working with Lumio for a while, then you become an equal co-owner with the rest of us. And so now we have 11 owners instead of one. You know? Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm up for the question, I'm up, I'm up for the challenge of how do we actually get these technology co-founders to have a clue about power and how it operates. <laughs> now just begin. So, wow, you are not anymore an engineer. <laughs> I'm a lover. <laughs> yes, I know that. Um, uh, so, um, we're going from an island in the Pacific to another mm -hmm. island, mm -hmm. and we, we continue with Audrey Tang. Hello, everybody. I'm Audrey. I come from Taiwan, and Taiwan is an island with 23 million people, and we're six hours in the future. Uh, in, in the future, uh, we put a supercomputing hacker into the prime minister position. In the future, we solved already the Uber problem. In the future, uh, we also introduce virtual reality to deliberation, and in the future, we resolve also the singularity. And uh, <laughs> so, so, uh, so here's how. Ha also, it's been very fast. <laughs> exactly. And so, so here's I only have ten minutes. So here's here's how how we did it. Um, just uh, yesterday, uh, last Friday, we, uh, our new president came to office, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen. I voted for her, I'm very happy. I voted for her because um, I live with eight cats and two dogs. And uh, she's a fellow animal lover with very similar ideas like marriage equality, diversity, abolishing uh, capital punishment, animal welfare, even animal rights. And then so, so she's just so, so great. And the, the thing is that 
she's a uh, first family because she's not married or partnered. This is our first family. And so uh, you cannot really bribe the first family members. Well, you can with catnip, but they will not change Dr. Tsai's policy for you. And uh, the important thing here is that from the January general election to the May, which is the finish of transition of power, the four months was free of party politics. There's uh, completely peaceful. And that's because our outgoing prime minister was a director of engineering at Google who quit his job at Google to work in the administration as the prime minister. And so, okay, well, <laughs> then you will take more time. So, so then um, Simon, Simon's main contribution was introducing this open data by default policy where all the government systems under 1 million uh, euros in budget are open data by default. And that brought Taiwan to the number one spot in the open data uh, global index. We become a machine readable country. And uh, the next prime minister, the current one, Lin Chen, is also independent. There's no party affiliation. So the two nonpartisan prime ministers agree a transparent transfer of power with all the materials of all the ministry published first on the internet and then next to the next administration. And this is the norm. Our Taipei City, the capital mayor, a medical professor, is also no party affiliation and also the occupier. And uh, then our vice president, also Chen Jianren, a researcher of epidemics, also independent. And this be happened because of the Occupy, which I already talked about. Basically, we're saying, you know, fuck ideologies. Uh, we, the Sunflower Generation, is now going into the, the government, and we're rebuilding it from the ground zero up. It's the gov zero spirit. Now, why do we have thousands of civic hackers hacking on democracy? Because we are the first generation who speak out freely. Our parents' generation suffered great brutality at censorship, dictatorship area. The year 1988 was the first year of press freedom, and it's the year of personal computers. And 1996 was the first presidential election. It's also the year of wild web, right? So the idea is that internet democracy for us is not two things, it's the one thing. And when we say free, we always mean freedom. And when we work on uh, software for freedom, we, w we see its social impact. Like in Nudibu, they, they are using the tools that we improved during the Sunflower movement. So yes. who, who, give, who wants to give like a few more minutes to Audrey? So I can speak so slower? So she, she, she <laughs> okay. can speak a little bit slowly. OK. okay. So we're going to. Uh, let's five, five some minutes. minutes from the question okay. times, okay? Okay, thank you. So uh, by the end of uh, the, the 2014, after the Occupy, uh, the occupiers won practically every major city in Taiwan in the city level elections, something that happened here. And so the, the idea is that with the uh, occupiers at the city level government, the national premier just resigned saying, okay, I don't understand these people. And then a new prime minister, the engineer says, okay, I want to work with occupiers to reinvent policy making. And we did a survey that polls what kind of uh, national domestic policy you want to solve. And the top one was the virtual epidemic that paralyzed all the governments around the globe. It is the epidemic called Uber. And uh, Uber is not just one company, it is a, a virus of the mind, a meme. Uh, it causes self-sharing economy. And there's no, nothing that a sovereign state can do. I mean, you, the Paris can shut down its local office, but then it just keeps running, right? So the, when the taxi driver surrounded the Ministry of Transport, saying we want to negotiate with the sharing economy, you know, how do you negotiate with a virus, with an epidemic? There are different category of things, right? So, Oh, the Minister of uh, Cyberspace, Jacqueline Tsai, who quit her job as Director of Law in IBM Asia, says the only way that we can do this is by deliberation, by getting everybody to talk to each other. Because only by thinking about one problem very deeply together, listen to each other, and this is the immunity, this is inoculation against the virus of the mind, because then people become immune to the future per PR campaigns. And the proper deliberation, as many of you know, involves four stages. The facts, the feelings, well, how do we react about those facts? The ideas, what are the possibilities opened up by the feelings? And then finally, the collective consensus on those possibilities. But in the bad old days, it wasn't like that. The government, the private sector lobbyists, the civil society on the street have different copies of facts. They don't even agree on the basic facts. So in that environment, uh, without facts, without sharing each other's feelings, idea grow up to be something very dangerous virus of the mind called ideology. And ideology's symptom is that it blinds us to other people's feelings. It blinds us to the facts that are uncovered. So Minister Jacqueline Tsai said, okay, I'm not releasing just the open data, but also the meeting transcript, the tr studies, the analysis, anything that as a minister she receives, she pu published online. And she asked the private sectors and the civil society to do the same. 
And then we introduced a, a visualization interactive system called Polis, a startup in Seattle. <coughs> it's free software. And, and on two dimensions, you can see how uh, apart or how convergent people are, your Facebook friends and so on. And you go there that slide, you see one statement from your friend, and you say yes or no. Once you say yes or no, your avatar moves on this plane so that you can see which camp are you mostly likely belong. But we use it in a way that says, if anybody could come up with a statement that convinced more than 80% of the total population, then we bind ourselves to use that as the agenda of rulemaking and face-to-face -face negotiation. And so, all, everybody, taxi drivers, Uber drivers, uh, Uber passengers, uh, like ride-sharing community, everybody came online, and 3,000 people shared all sorts of ideas. And by the fourth week, we have a set of seven consensus items agreed by everybody, with the top one being 95% consensus from a Mozilla Firefox hacker who says the government should subsidize and work with the co-op community, setting up a five-star rating system so that they can ha compete head-to-head -head with Uber and encourage this kind of local sharing community. So, and so this become our agenda, and we brought everybody to the table and, and to broadcast this transcripted live for the whole nation to see. And with this kind of structure, because there is clear consensus, what the administration has to do now is just to translate it into legalese. We put this back, they code, and then Finally, just this Monday, it's ratified into law. Uh, Taiwan has a now a, a new law that says app-based uh, dispatching systems are legal as long as they don't undercut existing on the taxis. And then they must uh, clearly de display identification, per right revenue must be taxed, audited indep independently, and so on. And there's already civil society-based sharing economy uh, ventures entering the market, and we hope, of course, Uber will uh, succumb to this new, new situation. And, but things like Uber and then Airbnb after that, which we also deliberated very successfully, are high profile. But there are many other things like uh, land justice, uh, justice reform, cultural policy that doesn't get much spotlight from the mainstream media because there's no fighting point. So the occupiers also created our own media. To the left is the reporter, which was crowdfunded, everything's open source, creative commons. And the, the crowdfund was 300,000 euros in the first week. And uh, so, so basically, we have a investigative journalism on public issues that is subscribed by 100,000 people. That is the new channel from the occupiers. And to the right is the Talk to Taiwan, an interactive web TV show that is crowdsourced our content. So the content was crowdsourced with the police system that we say, okay, this week we're inventing maybe the mayor talking about Medicare, maybe the prime minister talking about cyber infrastructure, and then this will determine the agenda. We do a design sketch infographics, and then the a person just talk like this for one hour, and then the first 40 minutes, they explain their vision very carefully, and then the 20 minutes after that, we do this rapid uh, fire Q&A so that everybody can see on the, on the same page. And because we use this kind of VR recording at first, uh, it creates a different kind of space. Because with traditional cameras, you're just a blurred talking hat, and you imagine an audience behind it, and you talk very loud and very like like divisive, right? But with this kind of things, we become attuned to the people around us. Because if I tell a joke and they're not laughing, everybody can just turn around and see that they're not laughing. So it, it becomes a listening uh, space. And we also use this not just for national policies, but also for lo local-based negotiations. Like this is the Feiyan village where the uh, construction company, the archeologist, the ecologist, and the local resident all sit down uh, come up with 11 preparatory meetings, the same presentations, and determined a balanced, eclectic uh, compromise between the construction interests and the ecological interests. Now, for things like this, it's okay. But for things like large-scale uh, land use planning, this is not that okay because while we have open data by default, the architect's vision or the land use urban planner's vision are not that easily translated into everybody's language. So we need a letter of experts. So we're now also experimenting with the Taiwan Best HTC Vive technology to put everybody into the vision. This is not an artist in, uh, impression. This is real software uh, so that we can sit down and deliberate in the future airport in version one, version two, take out this wall, see how the sunlight changes and so on. And this has applications like this is the Formosan uh, clouded leopard. It went extinct around the time I was born. Taiwan is uh, home to about 1.5% of all species on Earth and 10% of all marine species on Earth. It's huge biodiversity. But their habitat are being destroyed. And when the 2014 Occupy Parliament won, 
uh, the head of parliament said, okay, we agree, now go home. We did not go home. We go to the environmental agency, surrounding the environmental agency, until they uh, canceled this road construction that would make the leopard cat extinct. So the thing is that, uh, why, why can we mobilize so, so much? I was so touched at the time. It's because the cats are really cute. And, and <laughs> I mean, it's true. Uh, but what about stray dogs? What about the, the animals that are not less, like, less cute, but equally important to the biosphere. And the answer came to me when I was in Paris Disneyland two uh, months ago. Uh, there is this Ratatouille virtual reality ride where for five minutes I was put into shrunk in the size of a rat and then chased by humans dropping from the ceiling and so on in virtual reality. So I'm like, aha, this is how we put the, the viewpoints of all the animals to the people and so that we can deliberate not only for humans but also for animals. Now. Uh, these VR technologies were originally designed for gaming, but I like you to uh, imagine democracy as a game, but with a purpose. It's fun to participate in a democracy deliberation, that's fine. It solves the sortation problem, but it's not just about voting, because voting is just like clicking like, right? It's just one bit of information. And then we have open data where you can share all the individual budgets and laws and items and statistics, and then we get a bigger, the bigger picture, which is better. And now we have a, a working forum system where anything you ask, all the ministers uh, are required to reply within seven days, and you bridge the gap between the public servants and the civil society. And after that, we can have a real discussion in which uh, the public uh, issues are uh, commented like the talk to Taiwan. And finally, we can have binding deliberation due to this uh, result of those uh, uh, discussions and deliberations and finally sign them into law. But what I want to tell you is that this last one, the agenda setting power, this level of the game never comes from above. This only comes when we are ready uh, as people, as citizens, to share authentically the purpose of our lives with each other. Otherwise, this never comes from above. And the thing that blocks us from authentically sharing our life's purpose are the divisive ideologies. Those uh, ideologies are virus of the mind that split people into filter bubbles with aid of social media technologies that says, okay, we only talk with labor or with capital or with only science or only with religion and so on. And so it, it just blinds people to each other. But the problem is that another kind of technology, disruptive technologies, like artificial intelligence, virtual reality, self-driving cars, are forcing all the community to clash into the middle, sometimes very violently. And in this kind of the case, the American narrative is that, okay, so with the ultimate clash will just happen in the middle. It's called technological singularity. And in the singularity, it, what it means to me is that all the people lose, lose all our agency at the same time. And it, this is obvious that, that's topic, but it's only because if we subscribe to the ideology that say this is what an individual can do, define the limit of what the individual can do, and now machine do it better, so of course we're terrified. But the singularity doesn't have to be this way. In mathematics, singularity can be resolved very peacefully by plotting this on the extra, extra uh, T dimension, which means that we meet at its origin, and then we talk to each other, and we meet, listen, and then we meet again, and we listen again. And, and by this time, we have a multitude of people, not just people, but animals, rivers, plants, and so on, but most importantly, the multitude of our past and future imagination of ourselves. And this multitude meet at the origin, become a plurality. And once we have a plurality, we're ready for the singularity. The singularity may be near, but plurality is here. So I want to say something about uh, that Dr. Tsai Ing-wen when she talked um, in her inauguration speech. She said, before democracy was a showdown between two opposing values, but now democracy is about a conversation between many diverse values. We must build a united democracy that just is not hijacked by ideology. It's an efficient democracy that responds to the issues of economy of society and a pragmatic democracy that let people take care of each other. And this is our experiment in reinventing democracy in Taiwan. It's just by listening to each other. So thank you for listening. <laughs> so, wow. I hope you are still alive. Um, so, thank you. So, eh, um, bueno, todo esto de, de descentralización del poder no solo tiene que ver con democracia, también tiene que ver con la economía. Y, por último, vamos a, vamos a acabar con Marcos Ashi, que él está en diferentes proyectos relacionados, eh, bueno, uno es Dine.org y otro es eh, Freecoin, y está relacionado con eh, herramientas de blockchain para crear monedas eh, en el blockchain. 
Entonces, pues, eh, dejo a Marco que nos cuente un poco. I can, I, I try to explain uh, what yes. we do. Okay. Better than me. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I start asking you uh, how familiar are you with the blockchain and Bitcoin narrative, if you can tell me, so we know. Okay, less than half. But you know what it is, okay. Um, so when we talk about Bitcoin, we talk about uh, distributed ledgers, we talk about cryptocurrencies, uh, we talk about decentralized money um, in concept, okay. So I want to start with um, um, recalling a bit uh, what we've said uh, till now. Not everything. <laughs> um, but, you know, in the first presentation we had the words accountability, responsiveness, transparency. Uh, then we had uh, uh, hacking the top of power. Then we had technology and power, bodies, free software, and uh, the virus of the mind and the sharing purpose. Um, we started our work uh, with the virus of the mind, uh, which is the current money system. And uh, we started with a cr uh, critique of that. Uh, so Freecoin is uh, um, the digital social currency stream uh, of the Decent platform. Um, so uh, we're working uh, inside Decent. Uh, Decent is, uh, well, the project you heard about all this week. It's for a, a direct democracy. It's a social network. And uh, we wanted to uh, push the envelope and uh, try to see what it means direct democracy with money especially uh, for the situation of crisis that we've been living at least since 2008, but it's older than that, let me know. So we had um, the mandate, let's say, the responsibility to build up uh, for the communities we are serving uh, in Spain, Iceland, and Finland, three different systems, because uh, otherwise uh, we would just give them the euro, but we know that the euro is not performing as uh, we would like it to perform. So we said, okay, uh, let's pick up uh, knowledge from alternative complementary currencies, the knowledge on the Bitcoin and uh, blockchain revolution, and uh, knowledge from uh, uh, direct democratic practices. And uh, we came up with this notion of uh, social currency, digital social currency, since uh, Decent is a digital platform. And uh, the social currency has to be meant uh, in two meanings. Uh, one is the Latin one and one is the Anglo-Saxon one. So the social currency on the continental Europe means uh, social money, so money with a social purpose. When you go to England, it means more like uh, reputation. Your social currency is your social capital, uh, is your reputation in the community you're active in. And so we said, okay, let's build up on reputation and social purpose currency and see what happens if we apply uh, the distributed ledger blockchain architecture. And what happened was the creation of uh, Freecoin. And uh, Freecoin is uh, the result of one year of uh, qualitative and field uh, research uh, in Spain, Iceland, and Finland, and one year of uh, design and uh, software coding. So uh, we are now uh, almost ready to use it. Uh, what we have done in Spain is uh, working in Catalonia uh, with um, an association uh, organization called Eurocat. What they wanted to do and they want to do, uh, well, we ended up on the local journal uh, in uh, last March when we have, we have done a workshop there. The idea there was to have a social control of credit, so you see the democratic element and the money element uh, uh, merging. And uh, what it means, it means to have, uh, sorry, it means to have essentially uh, a community, in this case a community of businesses, uh, but also um, the municipality was uh, on the pipeline, especially because uh, with the Barcelona and Comú um, victory, on the program they had the Moeda Social um, kind of point, uh, and uh, they were very open also uh, to work uh, in these terms uh, also with the public sector. Uh, what we have done, is to build uh, a system called uh, a micro endorsement, a micro uh, mutual credit system, sorry. So you have uh, uh, the possibility to endorse others uh, in your own uh, business community, local uh, regional business community. And uh, as you endorse uh, a business, uh, and you've been endorsed by another business, you create a complementary currency called uh, Eurocat. So Eurocat uh, is the result uh, of trust dynamics uh, that create the currency uh, as a result uh, indeed of the interactions that people in an economic environment uh, uh, are able to, to perform and they want to perform. Um, what we have done uh, then uh, was to uh, find a way, oh, sorry, was to, it's better, because I don't hear myself, sorry. Um, 
we had to find a way, uh, since we were operating uh, with a blockchain, uh, to retrieve the trust. Because if I see that the company doesn't do what I was expecting the company to do, then I can reallocate the trust and reallocate the currency to another company. And so we developed a multi-signature module. Um, and uh, so we, we are using uh, uh, a sort of uh, free coin has to be seen as a piece of software that stays between uh, an API, so uh, the user interface uh, that contains the, inst the incentive structure that you want to implement uh, within a community, and then you bridge it uh, uh, with a blockchain of choice. Because we said, okay, Bitcoin is the most successful, uh, is the first one, but maybe it's not going to be the one that uh, is going to last uh, or the one that is going to serve these communities at best. So we said the community has to be able also to choose the blockchain of reference that they want to implement. And um, uh, in Spain, we said, okay, uh, let's create, uh, let's ignite uh, this, um, this system. Uh, and uh, this decentralized part was uh, the blockchain part dealing with trust. So uh, we managed the trust dynamics, uh, the microvales, they call it in Spanish, the endorsements. But then the currency has to be managed uh, by um, a centralized software that is very used in complementary currency systems uh, called Cyclos. And uh, we are getting now to the integration between the two so the system can work. Uh, turning the page, we moved to uh, Finland. And uh, there, the situation was uh, dealing with a community-supported uh, agricultural project in Helsinki. And uh, we have uh, sort of 200 families, uh, 500 people. And uh, the story goes that they have a common allotment, and uh, uh, they hire it seasonally. They produce the vegetables there. And uh, they have um, 20 streams of activities that has to be executed for the co cooperative uh, to continue. And this is based on voluntarism. So um, the problem for that community, and we tried to solve it, was to uh, find a mechanism for self-remuneration. So we created uh, the coin, uh, we pre-mined it, uh, we put it in a common pot, let's say, uh, we call it money totem. Uh, this totem stays at the center of the cooperative. Everybody on his uh, device uh, has uh, his own wallet, their own wallet, but also a copy, of, uh, a backup of the uh, totem wallet. So everybody has all the funds of the community. So everybody can steal from everybody else. Everybody can see uh, how everybody else gets remunerated. And so it's total transparency there. Uh, and uh, in my opinion, it's a symbol, uh, more of a symbol is um, uh, an actual example of how a community can uh, reappropriate uh, the power of issuing money of owning the money that the community has and to circulate it uh, independently of an intermediate uh, or a you know, bottleneck uh, kind of uh, node that has to decide uh, where this money has to go. The third example uh, and final one uh, is in Iceland. It's more relevant also to what is happening here in Madrid uh, with all the narrative on uh, uh, participatory budgeting. So in Iceland, uh, we have uh, almost 300,000 people, uh, total population. 120,000 uh, in Reykjavik, and uh, in Reykjavik there is uh, an annual uh, participatory budgeting event. This was going on uh, already before Decent started. Uh, when you have a good idea, uh, you put it on a platform. Uh, if you get the votes, uh, you get social credits, they call them, and it's your reputation on the platform. What we said is, uh, why don't we just transform the credits, because you gain them uh, doing something good for your community, proposing something that the community voted for you, a la Lumio, let's say, and uh, uh, we transform these credits in crypto coins. How you use these crypto coins for? Well, uh, they become a discount uh, for the public transport. Uh, they become uh, a free entrance in a public facility in Reykjavik. They become uh, a discount to get into the Reykjavik uh, International Film Festival. They promote what we call the uh, anthropogenetic uh, model of uh, human development. So um, it promotes all the activity that does that are uh, you know, economically uh, meaningful and sustainable, um, no speculation, uh, we stick uh, with the productive economy. They provide the health services, they provide mobility, they provide culture, they provide education. And uh, we wanted to use the technology of Bitcoin uh, to develop this kind of domains of society, because as far as the Bitcoin narrative goes, uh, it's a bit stuck into financialization and uh, speculation. It's more used as the, you know, uh, a store of value than a means of exchange, uh, which what money should do, especially well in austerity Europe today. Um, all these three examples are just uh, to give you an idea of how uh, you can use Bitcoin uh, for the social good. We heard yesterday that uh, 
the very uh, European Commission is running a workshop on the 21st of June uh, called uh, um, Blockchain for the Social Good, which is a title of a paragraph uh, of a section of our devil deliverables on free coin in decent. So it means that from the bottom up uh, that, uh, well, we are all here describing uh, somehow with different experiences, also with money and the technology that we have today, it's quite possible to ignite processes that cannot even, uh, um, well, hinder or obstacled so much uh, by what we call central authorities and top-down authorities because they see that there is value there, a social value there, and uh, they want to jump uh, uh, on the right train. Uh, because we know um, that mathematically, um, well, I'm Italian, I was saying before I'm from Europe, but uh, I was born in Italy, grew up in Italy. Um, we have, uh, well, a fantastic uh, public debt. Uh, we know anybody will be able to pay it. So um, why should continue to stick to listen uh, uh, to European Central Bank bulletins? Or, uh, uh, you know, when you read uh, a report on uh, cryptocurrencies from the European Central Bank, uh, you read that... Um, fundamentally for them is not a threat unless it doesn't uh, threat the authority uh, of, the, the monetary, um, of the monetary authority that the European Central Bank is. And uh, why so? Because uh, if you run out of solutions, and as they are doing, because they're buying time uh, with the policies that we are seeing, like quantitative easing uh, and all that exotic stuff they're doing, um, you need to turn to somewhere else to find the solution you want. Uh, Bitcoin, in my opinion, is not the solution. We don't know what's the uh, blockchain of reference of the blockchain of tomorrow. Let's say that, uh, well, uh, at the beginning, uh, everybody was excited about Napster. Um, I don't know who is using Napster today. So maybe also with Bitcoin uh, and blockchains, uh, um, the situation will be different uh, in five, ten years from now. But we know that uh, Bitcoin opened a bridge because it opened the possibility to have a money system that is uh, really distributed and uh, it's uh, more democratic uh, than the one uh, we had for the past 400 years and so the idea is to really uh, continue to dig in that direction and uh, it's very uh, for me thanks, uh, for me it's very topical that uh, projects like this and receive funding uh, from uh, the European Commission, so Euros, uh, in order to solve problems that the Euro uh, cannot solve. So the more money will go in projects like this, or uh, the more efforts will be done in projects like Bitcoin, the more innovation we would have, and uh, the quicker uh, the usual system will become obsolete. Uh, thank you, I'm done. Thank you. So, um, <laughs> so um, it's time for questions now for you from you. Uh, maybe we well, this is one of the problems of digital participation that maybe you don't have many participation, but well we we have some and we can also like split with also with uh, analogic participation. So um, the first question is everybody ready? For questions, yes. So the second one, how can we bridge the digital divide and include people who trust paper more? So I don't know if any of you would like to try to answer this question. In Spanish or what is it? Entiendo como la parte de los problemas de, de como centrarse en la tecnología, en, hay una proliferación de tecnologías y herramientas, unas más pulidas que otras, otras que se mantienen para siempre como una fase un, como un poquito eh, torpe, pero yo quisiera hablar sobre la parte de como en nuestra experiencia que es como sortear la brecha digital, ¿no? Como, o incluso cuando hay acceso a internet, eh, 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 poder generar otro tipo de vínculos para que las personas estén dentro de las decisiones si no van a estar en la plataforma que iba a resolver todo. Eh, algo, tal vez es ir yendo a, a algo, soluciones un poquito más sencillas, un poquito más hacia atrás, pero lo que hemos encontrado es, uno, eh, pues abrir las puertas del Congreso, creo que eso es claro, se recibe gente todo, todos los días, es una forma tal vez muy tradicional, pero bueno, hay, hay muchos políticos que no lo hacen. Y otra es... Eh, 
estimulando estos espacios, eh, recuperando espacios públicos, eh, sacando a las instituciones de, de, de sus corazas, ¿no? de estas fortalezas donde se encierran. Eh, desde febrero arrancamos un programa en la Diputación que se llama Congreso a las Calles, que regresa ca cada, eh, que va a Cuma a cada una de las colonias, a sus, a sus espacios públicos, a sus centros culturales, a las canchas de fútbol, y tiene reuniones con vecinos que no, no solo generan eh, es, espacios eh, de, de, de discusión y de contacto directo con, con su representante, lo cual es muy valioso porque sí, sí abona, a, o sea, todo se está registrando para, a, para tener un impacto sobre, sobre su labor legislativa, sino que también eh, genera espacios de encuentro, volviendo un poco a eso que hablábamos. ¿no? Está eh, como ejercicios de pedagogía compartida, donde dos vecinos que se conocían tal vez, pero jamás habían hablado de política en su vida, empiezan a hablar sobre los problemas, conocen a, a, a la persona que está al frente de su junta vecinal y, y, y de alguna forma, de una forma muy sencillita, empiezan a involucrarse sobre, sobre lo público y sobre lo común. Eh, para la reforma de participación ciudadana hubo un, hubo un primer borrador eh, que sí usó una herramienta de participación directa que, de la democracia directa que se llama Astuley, eh, pero bueno, eso fue solo el inicio, luego tuvo que pasar, a, 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 o sea, no era vinculante, tuvo que pasar eh, a la comisión, se discutió entre todas las fuerzas políticas, se hicieron foros, esa fue otra parte importante, se hicieron foros de participación ciudadana, eh, pues, pues los mejores que había hecho el Congreso a, a la fecha, por un ejemplo, un equipo de siete personas frente a la veintena de asesores y la infraestructura de partidos de los demás. Y, y eso eh, generó otros espacios, tanto con academia, con movimientos sociales y con el público en general, que pudo perfeccionar la ley para volverla a la, devolverla a la discusión y, y generar la, la, la propuesta que, que hoy se aprobó en consenso. Entonces, no sé, un poquito respondiendo como la parte de do, donde no hay una legislación como para hacer vinculantes o, o las posibilidades de hacer vinculantes estas herramientas de participación, de participación tan directa, eh, se puede integrar de alguna forma dentro del proceso. Ok, vamos a ir a la segunda pregunta directamente. What is the role of art, poetry, illustration, aesthetics, etc. in politics? So, I don't know if... Art politics? <laughs> <laughs> Me? I think Jensen is the uh, expert. Yeah, when we um, try to publish online contents about new politics and bottom-up uh, citizen participation in politics, one thing we tried on was how to make it easier to understand. Because in political field, I think there are two forms of documents. One is extremely difficult to understand what they are talking about. <laughs> so um, there are many administrative jargons, professional jargons, and the long sentences. And it is very hard and very boring. Nobody wants to read it. The other type of political uh, discourse is just uh, image-based uh, propagandistic content. Uh, slogans, photoshopped uh, images, uh, those are very um, frequently used in election campaigns. But actually, they do um, say nothing. Uh, people need to know. So how to um, make understandable but very correct uh, focusing um, um, the, the statement, how to make it, that was one of our tasks. So uh, when we publish the contents, we um, made many illustrations, cartoons, And also, and now we are doing work uh, for videos, uh, short video news, and uh, some animation, illustration, and some card news. But to make just a full uh, cut of cartoon, we need to research more. We need to study much, much more because we have to summarize in very correct way. Otherwise, it can distort the real meaning of the context. So uh, when we try to use uh, social media and the internet targeting uh, more young, um, young citizens, I, I think the format of the content is very important, ed as important as the real message of the content. So uh, 
I think art, illustrations, and any kinds of performance, artistic performance beyond just verbal text, uh, that is very important to promote um, civic participation. Okay, this is dynamic, so it's changing all the time. Uh, I think now the most uh, valuable one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> is the, this is art in, in democracy. No? Uh, participatory platforms have proven useful in widening participation and collecting new ideas, but they still fail at building consensus. Should, the, should this be seen as a tech challenge or a political one? <laughs> Can I answer that one? Yeah, of course. Yep. <laughs> um, so in my experience, um, you can only really build consensus when people care about each other. Um, it's the only way to resolve a conflict is if, if people care about each other and the, um, perhaps the historical way of doing, making people care about each other is you give one of those people a gun and then it's like, well, I care about what that person with the gun thinks and so I'm going to do what they tell me. But um, our ambition is to do consensus building that's non-coercive. You know? And that's an a, a absolutely fundamental shift in the way that we coordinate with each other. If, we, if we're going to say... Um, Force is no longer an option. We have to redesign more or less everything because so much of the way that we relate to each other is, is premised on this idea that there's force somewhere in the background that controls how people um, relate to each other. And so there's a little tiny bit of technology involved with that. You know, we're building a tiny piece of technology. I, I think Lumio was a, 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 an eggshell thin crust of, of the shift that needs to happen, and the inside of that shell is the culture. And that's so in, in, in our context, we've got um, 13 people working in, in the co-op, and we don't have a boss. So practically, how do we decide what to do next? How do we decide how to spend the skimpy resources that we've got? How do we um, d develop a collective identity and, and broadcast a message that's coherent? All that sort of stuff we have to invent, and that's um, inventing through cultural process, and it's not... It's, it's augmented by technology and it's, it's, it's made more rapid by technology. You know, like I've got my computer here, um, I've got 10 different tools open that we use all of the time to help. So if that's a, a distributed calendar or a collaborative document or an IRC chat room, or there's all these, th there are elements involved with doing that, but it's actually more about the, the practice of how do we relate to each other when we're not prepared to use force. And that, and that culture, I think, is moving at the rate, at human speed. You know, the, the culture is transmitting face-to-face. Um, -face. It moves like a biological virus, not like a computer virus. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we have time for the last one. But it's also from for Korea. How the relationship in Korea between politics, innovation, in democracy and participation, and increasing worker co based movement and social based and entrepreneurship sector? I think it's for you, Jensen. But yeah, 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 we, yeah. we have many. We have not many time. If you can. Yes, very quickly. Uh, does the question mean that uh, there would be any any uh, any connection between political innovation, activism, and new kind of social economy and entrepreneurship? Okay, good question. The second part, the sharing economy and enter, uh, social enterprises tended so far to be uh, a political so far. Um, because uh, in their point of view, politics is very old frame. They w wanted to, you know, just to um, neglect any, any political discourses uh, those seem very boring and unproductive and um, nothing to mean. But recently, uh, I found more and more social, uh, social enterprises, uh, enter entrepreneurs, uh, they are becoming to be more aware of the necessity of the fundamental innovation, including the politics. Okay, so I think um, I think the rest of the questions, if you are here, maybe because there is a streaming, so maybe some questions that are coming from outside here. Uh, I think we're going everyone now to 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 have lunch, so maybe we can continue just there. Mm -hmm. And so I would like to thank everyone.
and well, it's done.